Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Front Row Cinema, a movie podcast for movie lovers by movie lovers. I am your host, TJ Tromboli, and with me, as always, is my co-host. Today, one of the greatest FedEx drivers this side of the Mississippi, Mr. James O'Reilly. How's it going, buddy? It's going. And each week, we run down a movie from my 1,000 movies that we've seen in theaters, and we see how well it's aged, along with the hype surrounding the film, its box office analysis, and legacy in the film industry. And we have an absolute humdinger for you tonight. Jim, what are we watching? The Tom Hanks classic? Castaway. Oh, yes. That 2000s survival drama, Castaway, directed by Robert Zemeckis, starring Tom Hanks. We turn our attention here to the back of my lovely DVD, another movie that deserving of a 4K upgrade here as we go and we look and we run down the beautiful logline that they have provided us with tonight. And it follows. Tom Hanks gives one of the towering screen performances of all time as Chuck Nolan, a FedEx systems engineer who's ruled by the clock existence abruptly ends when a harrowing plane crash leaves him isolated on a remote island. As Chuck struggles to survive, he finds that his own personal journey has only just begun. Not Ooh. nearly as um, pun-filled as the last two weeks of Loglines have been. Yeah, they played it straight, which I think makes sense because this really is an Oscar bait kind of movie, right? Yeah, I guess you wouldn't really want to be... F- filling up the backlog of just silly puns with a really serious survival drama that you want to be taken, you know, very seriously. Right. I mean, on the back of your DVD, does it say, I don't know, how many Oscars it was nominated for or won anywhere? It does not, but I do have that knowledge up in the old noggin, Jim. I can tell you <laughs> okay. off the top oh, of no, my no, no. brain. We don't, we don't need to get into it yet, but I just, what I was going to say is, it would be really funny if there was a terrible pun next to, you know, <laughs> five time not Academy Award nominated. That'd be that would be very fun. They they do like a you'll be reaching for your lifeboat. Yeah. Two, when, two when, Oscar nominated when, movie. When deciding to make this movie, Robert Zemeckis really threw the rest of the cast away. With this two time nominated Oscar <laughs> yeah, movie. Exactly. Exactly. It just doesn't jive, you know. Well, since you brought it up, Jim, I'm going to throw it at you anyway. This movie was nominated for two Academy Awards for Best Actor and for Best Sound. Okay. It lost both of them. Russell Crowe won Best Actor that year? Yeah, right? yeah. I think we talked about this in yeah, the Gladiator about, episode. Gladiator I'm pretty sure had, Russell Crowe won, yeah. And I'm pretty sure Gladiator won Best Sound also. That sounds right off of my ooh, memory, ooh, which is not pun, very good. Pun intended right there. Look at you, Jim. What? You're doing your... Oh, you sounds sound. right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim, Jim. That one wasn't even on purpose. <laughs> That's how good we are. They just flow right off of us without even realizing. But as always, we love to dive into what we remember about seeing these movies when we were younger. Jim, do you did you see this in theaters? Not in theaters, but it's definitely one I remember watching more than a few times shortly after it came out on home video. Okay, and this was like a first, like this was this was reliving with new eyes almost. You haven't watched this in a long time, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think that this is probably my favorite episode that we're going to do yet because this is the first movie I can remember that I really didn't like when I watched it when I was younger. And so I was definitely interested to see what I thought of it uh, 20 plus years later. And... Yeah, with a new fresh perspective. Yeah, exactly. Like my movie going um, eyes and what I expect out of movies has changed a lot in the last 20 plus years. So I was definitely interested to see what I thought of it with that new kind of mindset about this, about movies. Yeah, I, I'm right in the same boat with you. I did. Ooh, you like I'm right in the same boat with you. Oh, my God. We're, on we're going to be shock full of those tonight. I do remember going to the theater to see this with my dad and my brother. Uh, me, and spoiler alert for anyone who doesn't know at home, Tom Hanks is mine and my brother Zach's favorite actor. Uh, we would watch that dude read the newspaper and I would give that movie five stars. So obviously Big Rob had to go take us to see this movie back then. Yeah, but I course. have not watched this movie often. Like this is when I when I'm revisiting my Tom Hanks movies, Castaway is not the one that's at the top. So I'm also in the same boat 
as you, Jim, in that I haven't oh watched. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to just keep using that one. Uh, I'm going to beat a dead horse with that boat joke. I haven't watched this movie probably in the same amount of time for you, like 20 plus years. So I'm also was looking forward to watching this again to see how my thoughts have changed um, on this movie. If I still enjoyed it as much as I did when I was a kid and with these, you know, fresh lenses, see just how this movie held up in the pantheon of Tom Hanks movies. Pantheon might be underselling it, honestly. True. Very true. This man has been, especially for us growing up in the, you know, 90s and 2000s, he was just putting out hit after hit after hit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he was probably the biggest movie star in the 90s. Yeah, so definitely. A lot I mean, that, that's a, that's a bold statement, actually, that I haven't put a lot of thought into, but <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got to be up there. Let's say that. Definitely up there. I would easily top five. You can make an argument for the top dog, but I think there's a few people in the 90s that could also like, you know, try and stake a claim to that. Yeah, yeah. And I just, um, I think it's one of those things where you, if you're debating it, you're probably not debating who's better. You're just debating a bunch of guys who are really good um, and do different things. And in the 90s and early 2000s is really when Tom Hanks is getting into his America's dad kind of groove, you know? Yes, it's really when, really when he became just America's sweetheart. Right, America's sweetheart, yeah. And he really grows into that throughout this time period. And, you know, because of movies like Castaway, they're a big reason. Yeah, absolutely. And so we'll continue along. Another thing that we love to talk about that I love to hear week after week come out of that, come out of that joyous mouth of yours, Jim. Let us run down. I want to hear some box office numbers. Numbers, dates, numbers, numbers, dates, array, dates, numbers. Show me the money. That's right, Jim. All right. Show me the money. Let's see some good box office stats for Castaway. All right. So Castaway is a Christmas movie. It opens December 22nd through the 24th. That's its opening weekend. It pulls in 28.8 million to take the number one spot. That's uh, uh four four day weekend with Christmas, thirty nine million, thirty nine point eight million. So, I mean, that's okay. like a smash, right? That's based upon the movies we've been looking at. That really cashes in on the the holiday. It makes near forty million dollars, which I think is probably one of the bigger openings we've had yet. Can you can you fill me in on that one? For Christmas, at least. Uh, though taking a look here, at least at least with the movies that we've been looking at. For at least a three-day weekend, 28, 29 million right there is is coming in on the low end. It's surprisingly that three-day weekend grossed less than the three-day weekend of Pokemon the first movie. So this this is sitting right in the number eleven spot right now with that twenty okay. opening where, weekend. Where, but, would, where would the where would the thirty nine put it? Yeah. So thirty nine would put it a little bit better would put it in between The Perfect Storm and Armageddon's opening weekends. Okay. But a lot of those didn't really have four-day opening weekends. But if, if we still just look at the three-day weekend right there, the 29 was still good enough to put it ahead of Titanic. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So Titanic only opened to 28.6. So this just right. barely nudged it out for that December Week opening right there. Right. Weak opening and a lot of legs for Titanic. Yeah. So I wonder if this so... movie is much in the same maybe had a bit more lay you you tend to see that over the holiday weekends where you have these movies that don't open to stellar numbers but they have legs they they stick around for a while yeah right because that january and february run that stretch is a is like a wasteland right yeah so okay so it opens to 28.8 million it beats out what women want in its second week which wow, I don't so know if Helen, you remember, but Helen what... Hunt is a uh, powerhouse this Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Helen Hunt's cleaning up. I, I don't know if you remember What Women Want is the movie that dethroned How the Grinch Stole Christmas uh, from a few and episodes back. Quite a classic rom com that was. So Castaway takes number one, and it's going to go on a little run here. Week yeah, two. Baby. Love a good run. What do you think the drop is for Castaway in week two? In week two? Ooh. Is it good or bad? Uh, it is good. It's good. Oh man. I don't so I don't I... want to give you too much of a hint, but 
I'm calling it a drop somewhere. might be inaccurate. Oh. Oh, so did it go up? No, there's it no goes way. up. Yeah, it goes it up. Goes up. So it did right. better its second weekend. Right, because you're wow. cashing in on that holiday. Your second weekend is the 29th to the 31st of December. Okay, you don't see a lot of movies. Not do a that, lot though. of people. Right, not a lot especially of people working. Yeah, especially ones that open you're, wide don't tend to like do better second weekend. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's it's New Year's Eve weekend, I suppose. New Year's is on a Monday, which actually I think is the same case this yeah, year. Yeah, this year. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it just it cleans up in that extra holiday weekend there at the end of December. It makes thirty point nine million. Damn. Beats what women want again, which also <laughs> went up. What women want went up thirty one point one percent from the previous weekend. Dude, Helen Hunt just sitting on a on a beach chair somewhere that weekend, <laughs> yeah. just counting money. Right. What women want comes in at twenty point eight, and then uh, Miss Congeniality comes in at third with fourteen point five million. Ooh, that's a, that's a decent little Christmas right there for moviegoers. And Castaway is going to keep running week three. It beats What Women Want again. <laughs> This week it gets twenty two point two million with a twenty eight point three percent drop. Damn, still though, three weekends in, you're still making plus twenty million. That's that's solid. Yeah, absolutely. Especially going into that first weekend in the new year is usually like a death zone for movies. So to still be putting up twenty plus million is very, very well done. That has good legs. Yeah, right, right. and we're we we've talked about January now and February a couple times on the on the show. And it is a spot where you have legs because things are, you know, there's not a lot of other movies coming out that people really want to see. But it's rare to see them bring in that much in a single weekend. It's more that you're like death by a thousand cuts in that in that time frame. Yeah. And in week four, our run is over. Ah. Castaway, <laughs> Castaway comes in second place with 19.7 million. That's still good. So, all right. So it had three weekends at number one. Right. So that's that on our list, Jim. That's that's good though. That three three weeks. I mean, one right there is good enough to put sandwich it in between Star Wars Episode One, which also spent three weeks, and just behind How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which had four weeks. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's not terrible. Um. So wait, do you want to take a guess at what movie beat it? All right. So this is two thousand and one. And we're we're January two thousand and one, right? Your first hint is that you are never going to get it. You fucking bastard. Um, can I have the genre, please, sir? Yes, it is a dance movie. Is it Save the Last Dance? It is Save the Last Dance. Did you look that up? How did you no, get that? No, no way. I, I was just, gonna say just... Julia Stiles was in it. How did you pull Save the Last Dance out? That's nuts. Once you said dance movie, there's only so many that it can be, and I know the majority of them are. I know it because Heather has made me watch that movie multiple times, and I know it came That's out in 2001. So I just That's took a fair, shot yeah. that it came out in January. Yeah. So to to <laughs> to give it some credit too. Save the Last Dance, I always judge how good a movie is or how how much I like it yeah. or maybe not how much I like it, but I'll at least have a, like a fond place in my heart for it. If there's something that I can remember about it, like a frame or a shot or yeah. anything visual that I can remember about a movie and Save the Last Dance, I always will remember that scene where she's learning how to dance with the folding chair kind of thing. And they're like, they're like showing each other up and she's being all saucy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I'll never, that image is burned into my brain when I read the words, save the last dance. So, you know, I mean, give it some credit that, you know, 20 plus years later since I've seen that movie and I definitely have some memory of it. Yeah, and I mean that's a good opening and, weekend for that movie too, for itself. Yeah, that opened January. to twenty seven point five million. This movie does stay in the top ten for quite a while. It doesn't drop to number twelve until weekend eleven. Oh wow! Yeah, so right, like we said, it it goes, it stays in that top ten through all of January, all of February. Weekend eleven is March second through the fourth. So ten, so ten weekends in the top ten. Yeah, 10 weekends in the top 10. 
That's good. Hey, that's that's so far we've only had two movies that we've gone through in this podcast that's been able to do that. So now we have our third member to join the double digit crew. So 10 weeks is good enough to put Castaway just ahead of Gladiator, which spent nine weeks in the top 10, and then just behind Star Wars Episode One, which spent 11 weeks. Yeah, I like that we're looking at this now, too. It's cool to see the idea of legs and not just openings and seeing what kind of staying power a movie has. Yeah, it's always I always enjoy looking at legs just as much as opening weekend because you really tend to see the movies that stick with audiences the most by how long it's spent in that top 10 consistently, you know, pulling in seats week over week in theaters. Right, yeah. And I mean just even looking at it like week six seven and eight it's pulling in you know 20 million combined but that's that's a pretty good ad- addition to the total you know yeah like at that point they're just you know that they're just printed money then and then while i'm at it the total it finishes with 233.6 million domestic okay 196 million worldwide which i'm noticing a weird trend where these international numbers are always very even i don't know what that's all about i guess maybe they're... they just charge ten dollars per ticket and it's <laughs> there's no there's no tax there's no change there's a base change ticket uh anywhere else you go in the country <laughs> right and that that gets it to a worldwide total of 429.6 million dollars and 429.6 is good enough to secure the seventh place spot right now, uh, just ahead of How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which uh, finished at 345 million, and just behind Gladiator, which made a whopping 503.1 million. So, not a bad tally for definitely a movie that was probably a tough sell. Like, this is definitely a movie that was sold on by tom hanks yeah oh i mean absolutely yeah this movie doesn't get made without tom hanks in it it's it's just there's no question about that i mean he he's the only person in the movie he's talking to a volleyball for about an hour of it yeah i know this just goes to show how large of a presence he was at this point in time that the movie star still had enough power to bring people into the theater And this is a perfect example of a movie star movie that brings you in based on the person alone. Because there's not just, (laughs) yeah, go on. No, sorry. Just to be clear, when I say he's talking to a volleyball, I don't mean literally it can't be made without him because nobody else is in the movie. I mean that Tom Hanks is the only guy that I can think of. Maybe there's a couple others if I really put my mind to it at this point that they can go to a movie executive or a director like Robert Zemeckis and say, I want to make a movie where I talk to a volleyball for an hour. And they're like, okay, yeah, let's talk about it. (laughs) They're like, all right, let's pitch it. (laughs) Everyone else is getting laughed out of the room, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny watching this movie in today's lens and be like, oh, like, do you think Leo saw this and was just like, I can do that. And then went to Alejandro and was like, let's make The Revenant. I mean, that movie came out way after Castaway, (laughs) right? Yeah. But this is basically just The Revenant, but with Tom Hanks on an island instead of Leo surviving a bear attack. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely see, I can see the similarities. I would say I'm kind of glad you brought that up because I think it's going (laughs) to, drive home a couple of my points about what I didn't like about this movie. Ooh. Well, I guess we should uh, dive into it now at this point. I, I've been patiently waiting, and I've been very excited to see what your thoughts were going to be on this movie, especially once I finished this movie. I was like, I can't wait to talk to Jim about this because I can't wait to hear his thoughts. So very excited to hear, Jim. What were your thoughts about this movie? Okay. I'm going to start with what I liked because – I do think it's important to say that I did like this a lot more than I did when I was younger. The number one thing I liked, and we got into this a little bit when we talked about Tom Hanks, his performance is through the roof, man. He's so good in this movie Um, to the point where I'm angry when you said earlier that Russell Crowe beat him for best actor because we just watched Gladiator a couple weeks ago and it's not even close. Tom Hanks crushes russell crowe 
in in just pure acting chops in this movie, he is leagues ahead, leagues above Russell Crowe. And we got into this a little bit too. For an hour of the movie, the only other thing in the movie is a volleyball with a face that he painted on it. And the scenes are so compelling and there's no one else to give the credit to other than Tom Hanks. It's just a him and a volleyball and a coconut tree. And and I'm and like I'm really interested in the drama of it, you know? Which yeah. is can't can't say enough about how good that is. Yeah, I really love how after the time skip, he's just a total feral madman, you know? Um the way he plays that off and including how gaunt and skinny he is at this point. Um, and just how he's, he's just arguing with Wilson again, the volleyball scenes are great. He's arguing with him about God knows what. Um, and then just real quick, I think the last half hour is what puts him over the top for me as what should be clear in a way, the best actor that year, because every scene is so cool. He's so out of place. Um, you know when he meets his his ex-girlfriend's new husband and they have that weird uncomfortable exchange outside the bathroom at the fedex or um or when he finally goes back and talks to his wife or sorry not his wife his ex-girlfriend um and they're both kind of slowly realizing that it just can't happen anymore and they're both feeling it out there's this one moment in particular when she pulls him in for the hug his face and that part is so good he um he plays this moment where he's so uncomfortable with the idea of getting hugged by her even though it's probably the thing he's wanted most in the world for years you know emotionally and he won't let himself have it there for a second because he doesn't quite believe in it and then he finally lets go and you can see him literally embrace it and it's just he's he's so good in this movie and sorry, I've been talking for a long time. So what are your thoughts? I want to hear what no, you think about by, all this. By all means, I've been I've been itching and waiting to hear your thoughts. So this is uh this is perfect for me. I completely agree with you on everything you've said about Tom Hanks. He is an absolute revelation in this movie. And it is insane having watched this movie and Gladiator like a few, you know, weeks or months apart now and just being absolutely gutted that Tom Hanks didn't win for this movie. I mean, we'd have to see who else was also nominated, but it is crazy that Russell Crowe got this award when you see this just stellar Tom Hanks performance because this is this is a this is a tough performance to do. This is not an easy task what he has to do in this movie. To no, to not carry even close. to carry a full like hour portion of that movie where it's just him doing survival shit. And having these phantom conversations with a volleyball, and you don't even get the portion from the volleyball. It's it's just him responding to what he thinks he's hearing from Wilson. And I would be very interested. This is another movie I'd be very interested to read the script for and see if even though you never like hear Wilson talk or anything, if they wrote dialogue in the script for him to play off of to react yeah. to how he was going to play it with Wilson. I mean, yeah, I definitely see what you're saying. I would, my thought would be, and this is a total guess. My thought would be that if, if there wasn't lines written in a script that he at least had an idea of what they were arguing about and what responses Wilson was giving him Tom Hanks. I mean, Oh no. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure on a base level, Tom Hanks, you know, maybe the morning of or day of when they're going over the shoot, he's, you know, creating that, you know, those, those conversations on paper for himself before he goes into it. But it would have been an interesting, I think, exercise too, like in the script, if they had been like, this is what they're actually talking about, but you're never going to hear Wilson's side of it. It's just Tom Hanks, you know, reacting to that whole conversation. Cause there's some of them right. that are, so, some of the faces, like I, fucking cried jim i cried at one of the scenes where he's like trying to sleep at night and then he just rolls over and looks at wilson he just goes can't sleep yeah <laughs> right like, they have he this rolled weird over relationship saw, yeah like rolled over saw wilson and was like oh you can't sleep either like i <laughs> died and like it's the it's it's little things like that that goes such a long way and it just proves 
so effective in this movie of just how well he carries the scene. You you completely buy it. I completely yeah. buy everything that he goes through with this volleyball. And another like little piece that works for me too that I love is in that time jump also. We cut back and, and you mentioned how we see Tom Hanks as this just absolutely feral man. And then we see Wilson and Wilson's also got like hair coming out of him as if like he's- Yes, been- yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they've both been through the ringer, and yeah. over the course of their relationship, they went from the point where he he went from opening up a, just a regular old volleyball to getting to here. Well done! Well done! Dude, and you buy every second that that happens when he's, like, shouting, like, it's... It feels so much more real and heartbreaking watching him lose Wilson than him losing his ex-girlfriend like later <laughs> on. Right, right, right. I mean, I don't know that I would say I care more. I, I disagree with you on that one. I think it's a fair opinion, but I, I definitely was way more into when he was, was talking to Helen Hunt toward the end. No, I do also, but it's 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 an interesting dichotomy i feel like between the two because like you were talking before when he has that whole big grand scene with helen hunt and you you see him like he's stumbling and and awkward and you can see that like he's this man who has you know lost that ability to connect with her in that level and he sees that he's fully lost that but it feels so detached because he's been away from her for so long Whereas when you see him losing Wilson, it's this visceral, quick, guttural thing because this is a lifeline that he's had for so long that when he's right, losing right. it, it's so quick and just fast like to lose him. It, and it's just seeing how they play the two scenes is, is one of those things that just really shows how effective both Tom Hanks and Robert Zemeckis were in the process of making this movie. Yeah. So now I feel like we've rang a lot of praise on this. <laughs> I'm gonna get into some things I didn't like. Here comes the pivot. And <laughs> there's I watched um I watched an interview that Tom Hanks did. I think with the, I think it was with the Ringer. It was Bill Simmons who was interviewing him, right? Okay. And the gist of the the first like I don't know three four minutes of the interview is that Tom Hanks and a a writing buddy. Um, I wish I remembered his name. We should look it up and put it in there at some point. Did the actual writer um, of the movie or is somebody I that probably worked with? Because the writer of the movie probably. is William Broyles Jr. That sounds right. Yeah, because he calls him Bill Broyles in the interview. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. So that. All right. So, so that's the guy who wrote the movie. Okay. So in this interview with Bill Simmons and Tom uh, and Tom Hanks, he's talking about how him and Bill Broyles had an act and a half for a movie. Okay. And it was based on FedEx, which, by the way, the first 15 minutes of this movie is one giant FedEx commercial. I was <laughs> so confused. Um, I liked the first couple scenes. I The Christmas dinner scene, I was so... I didn't understand why we were there. Everybody knew so much about FedEx. Yeah, it seemed like it was one of those ones where, like, the whole family, like, worked for FedEx. Because, like, the... Yeah. the the dad or the grandpa or whoever is like talking about like the guy who runs FedEx as if he like knows right, him personally. Right. Fed, yeah, Fred Smith and and Helen Hunt's like, oh, when I was there, we only did two million on the Christmas sort, you know. So it's it's like weird. It's almost like this is a movie about a guy who needs to escape the cult of FedEx. And <laughs> in the beginning, he's obsessed with time, you know. And and like over the course of the movie, he learns to let that go a little bit. And um, but anyway, I'm I'm on the things I don't like. That part I kind of do like. Yeah, I was gonna say like um, you you you're harping on the thing that I that I actually enjoyed about that movie. So the first twenty minutes or so, basically until the plane crashes, I just feel like we're spending way too much time there. You know, um, yeah. I don't know that this is a different movie if the plane back from Russia crashes exactly the same way the plane in this movie crashes. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I guess. You know, they wait because they want to get, you know, those scenes in with Helen Hunt um, of them in person and, you know, him giving the like, hey, hold on to this box, which is clearly like a proposal ring and all that to really like ring out um, all that set up. But I, I agree with you that I, one of the things that I thought could use the most tinkering was shrinking down the first act before he crashes because it does go on for, I feel like, way longer than it needs to. 
Yeah, um, I, I enjoy the setup because that's one of the things I, you know, really enjoy about this movie is this idea of this man who, you know, rules his life by time and he's trying to, you know, harness time. And the movie is about him realizing that you have no control over time. Like, right, it, right. And, and I and I love that. But I completely agree that the whole first act goes on for way too freaking long. Yeah, and so bear with me here, because it goes on for too long, but Tom Hanks is talking about how he has an act and a half of a movie, him and Bill Broyles. Yeah. And they talk to Robert Zemeckis about it, and, you know, it's it's kind of, and he's interested, but it doesn't really get anywhere. And he says four years go by, just like in the movie, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah. And he meets up with Robert Zemeckis again, and he's like, you know, me and Bill Broyles have been kicking this idea around for, like, years and years. And Robert Zemeckis, when I see him, he asks me about it. And he goes, you know, oh, are you still doing that that uh, Chuck something movie? Because they're not a different name. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Robert Zemeckis writes the second half of the movie for him, like, in that conversation. He's like, okay, well, like, here's what you need to do. This is how it should yeah. end. And this is what it's about, and, you know. And so that right there, that story, to me, is the problem with this movie. There's two different movies going on. It's getting tugged in two different directions. And the two directions are... The act and a half that Tom Hanks is talking about, where he's talking about FedEx planes and what happens if one of those that they send over the ocean every day goes down. Yeah. And and then he also talks about uh, the built-in drama of somebody being on an island, which is what you see, right, for most of the, the f- second half of that first hour is him, you know, like, for some reason, throwing coconuts at a boulder, thinking that's going to help in some way <laughs> before he realizes, oh, maybe I should try and break them open with like something more pointed, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so he so he talks about how there's built in drama there. So for me, this movie is trying to be two different things. It's trying to be the survivalist movie that Tom Hanks and Bill Broyles were kicking around. It can never really get anywhere on. And then at the same time, it's trying to be the movie where this guy gets off of an island and there's all this human drama and consequence of what happened to him. And they just, they don't jive for me, you know? Um, It almost feels like the inflection point for me is when he leaves the island. That either needs to be the very beginning of the movie, which it's the beginning of Robert Zemeckis' movie. He leaves... And he and he's now he has to come back to the world and go through, you know, all of the things he lost and figure out a way to move forward. Right. Yeah. Or it's the end of Tom Hanks's movie where this guy who struggled to survive and finally reached his breaking point, you know, sails out into the ocean and tries to get away. And then a big boat comes by and picks him up and he made it, you know. Yeah. And I just I don't know. I feel like it's trying to be both of those things. And it. it it takes away from it from me. Like I'm, I lose, it loses steam for me. And then it picks up big in that last half hour. Cause honestly, it's also about expectation. That's the part I'm most interested in is the Robert Zemeckis movie, you know? Absolutely. But I wonder if you're able with that Robert Zemeckis movie, if your movie just opens with this guy getting off this Island, then it's, I feel like that's a tougher ask to follow. I don't, I don't know if that second half of him off the island hits as hard if you haven't seen all of that yeah. stuff beforehand of him on the island and that build up with it. You're, you're a completely different movie at that point. And that's not to say that that couldn't end up also being a really good movie. But yeah, I, 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 guess- I, I, I get your sentiments where it, it definitely does feel like two opposing forces like vying for one movie. Right. And that's kind of my point is that it's a completely different movie and it feels like they're trying to exist in that same space, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I definitely, I definitely can get that for me. I, it, I can feel those at times, especially in that middle half, because I am, I was really digging on those scenes with him in the Island and yeah. it kills me every time it just cuts to four years later. And then we're four years later and his first idea is I'm going to make this pontoon and then he gets off the island and we're gone. And it's like, yeah, I guess, man. But like, you didn't even give me a montage of like him getting better. Like we just skipped right, right. ahead to him being better. Like, Right. Well, and that's the time skip skips a lot of the stuff I would have been interested in and also lends itself to what would be the end of Tom Hanks's movie. Right. Absolutely. When he's arguing, when he's arguing with Wilson about um, the boat, that they tested or something and it hit the rocks and it would have been really bad. And Wilson was right that they tested it. Why can't I watch that? 
You know, yeah. well, I want to the... see that happen. I want to the... see him try this thing and then fail and then learn from it and do better next time, you know? Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest emotional cruxes in this movie, too, that we don't even see is his failed attempt to kill himself. Right. Like, and, and that's right. not to say that his story later isn't amazing. Like Tom Hanks absolutely crushes that speech of him talking about that happening. But at the same time, that's something I want to see, not something I want yeah. you to just tell me later. Like in a right. play, yeah, sure, give me that great speech. But like in a movie like this, especially when we're seeing this survival movie, I want to see those scenes of him struggling on this island as he's learning to be here, especially if he's there for four years. Right. And the the scenes on the island struggle is the exact opposite for what I would say happens. You know, I mean, you know, there is built in drama, like Tom Hanks is saying, he needs to find food, he needs to find water. All of that is immediately evident to us. But how easy do those dominoes fall? Oh, yeah. Once he gets he through... figures it out in like 10 minutes. Yeah. Like he gets through the, the water part pretty quickly and then making fire. And then at that point, it's just knocks his tooth out and we're skipping ahead now. And it's like, why? right, right. Well, so I you, see... brought up, you brought up the Revenant earlier, right? Yeah. Talk about a movie where we see a guy bleed for it. You know, he literally bleeds for it for most of the movie. He's like crawling, you know, completely mauled by a bear, you know? Absolutely. Um, And, you know, I just, I don't know. I think. It was I, I was happy you compared them because I think it really does drive home the kind of movie that I'm looking for when I'm watching a guy stranded on a deserted island. I want there to be some serious struggle and some serious strain. And I just didn't get it. Yeah, no, I absolutely feel that it's it's definitely a a, a tough pull in this movie because you can see that even though it is a movie called Castaway where he's, you know, on this island learning to survive, it's almost that like that's not even the full point of the story. Like they're just as interested as everything going on outside of this island as they are as him on the island. Whereas in The Revenant, it's mostly let's make a two hour movie of Leonardo DiCaprio literally just struggling to survive. And we see every right. single moment of that. Right. Which, again, I think that's Tom Hanks. I think that's the movie Tom Hanks had in mind. Maybe not as hardcore and as gory as The Revenant, but when you're talking about a movie when a guy's stranded on an island, and I don't know, I guess he said he had the first act and a half, but to me, you there's really a lot you could explore there. But I don't know, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse at this point. <laughs> no, no, you you absolutely have a, have a point there. It's That's definitely one of the, I think that was the biggest thing for me of a downside when watching this was that time jump to four years later. And then he just immediately builds this pontoon and just sails off and gets away. Yeah. And that to me was like uh, this. And this was one of those movies that I know I always say sh shorter is better, but I was never bored at any point in this movie. So it wasn't even an ask where I was saying like, Hey, cut out a lot of shit. So you could have more of a middle. I could have taken this movie being an extra, like, 15 minutes longer to get more of those even even just a montage like it didn't even have to be something long like you do a montage of him you know struggling to fish he he chalks a day up on the boulder then he's learning to like build rope then he chalks another day up on the boulder and you can do these yeah. quick things that just show like you, just like team america always says baby you're gonna need a montage yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only thing um the only thing i would say is they probably avoided that trope of you know putting the tallies on something to keep how many days you had because the whole point is that he's giving up on time you know that is true but you could so you you wouldn't even need to do that because you also see that he figured out how to know what month it was by the light coming yeah. in too so you could have used that one as the crux where it splits yeah. and every time you cut back to that the light is at a different you know like sure. of the month. Yeah. and once we see march over and over again we know this fucker's been here for years yeah, you could do something, that's the point. And, and like something yeah. that makes the pacing less clunky in the middle of that movie. Yeah, but because the other the other problem is I think we're kind of spoiled these days because another thing he talks about in the interview is how they filmed it, which I don't think really lends itself to some of the less clunky ideas we're talking about. You're talking about how he they filmed the portion where he was portly and then they took a bunch of months off for him to lose the weight and then yeah. Filmed, yeah. 
Right. They filmed it in two sets, right? They filmed it when he yeah. was, you know, he put on some weight. I think he said he put on like 50 pounds or so for the for the beginning part of the movie. And they filmed all that. And then they waited a whole year. And it was interesting because the deal, I guess the deal Zemeckis made with the studio was, well, we'll film this first part. And we need to find some way to retain the cast and the crew and pay them so that they're available in a year when we want to pick back up again. So he um, he made a deal with the studio where he would retain the cast and crew and make another movie for them in the interim. Yeah, and he, he made uh, What Lies Beneath, right? <laughs> yes, yes. He made What Lies Beneath in the, in the time off they took between the first set of filming for Castaway and the second set of filming. Dude, and so, yeah, insane. it's That's you insane. Lose, yeah. So, but you think about back then for a guy to, you could, nowadays you could just CGI the extra weight and have him be skinny the whole time and do more of that transition. But also like he couldn't wear a fat suit. <laughs> I mean, he could have, you're right. You're not, you're not wrong, but I just, I get, I get the idea though between, well, no, of course he couldn't. First of all, he was going for an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is peak body transformation Oscar days. You know, you're right. You're right. I don't know what I was, what I was talking about. This, this, I didn't even think of this as that kind of movie. I didn't put it up there with the, the machinists of the world. Yeah, oh but my it God. really is when you think about that filming schedule. And yeah, I don't know. I just, I kind of get w why it's so abrupt in the middle of the yeah. movie based but, upon how they had to film it. Yeah, especially in that sense, it, it does then make a lot of sense why they just do that quick jump because they didn't have the luxury of filming throughout while he's losing this weight. They just had to go from one extreme to the other. So at that point, you're kind of a slave to doing it in that fashion. And, you know, I guess your mileage from that varies depending on, you know, what you get out of this. For some people that time jump might not be as much of an issue for us as for it, as it is for us. And I get it. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't ruin the movie for me, but it is something where I, I would have enjoyed more of him on the Island learning and adapting to survive there and really give up that sense of time management that he was such a slave to. Yeah, I don't know. I'd say that potentially it did ruin it for me because I keep talking about how I, it feels like two different movies. And I think the abrupt time shift is really the thing that does that for me. You know, that's fair. That's fair for me. I totally get that. It doesn't bother me as much because while. I do enjoy the survival aspects of this movie. It wasn't the thing that I was tethered the most to. I yeah. did enjoy the idea of the story of a man who has become such a slave to time that it it was just an interesting thing to watch this man become untethered from it and then be released back into this world and show how he's adapted to that knowledge uh, for that whole second half that you see. It's it's funny watching this movie being like how in with FedEx it is and just wondering like how did FedEx sign off on this movie because it's kind of about a dude who's like a slave to the FedEx grind and learns to right. like not be so like it's very much like it feels like anti like big business in a sense or it's like this guy's learning how he has to get out from underneath this machine. Yeah, and FedEx is just like, yeah, cool, dude, let's do it. This is something you see with movies a lot, though. Like, you know, like Wall Street, right? Isn't um, isn't a pro Wall Street movie. It's very true. But people, but people see Wall Street, and a lot of people say, "Man, that Gordon, what's his name? Gordon Gecko. Gecko. What a fucking that Gordon. Name. That Gordon Gecko guy is the tits. <laughs> I want to be just like him. You know? Yeah. How many people it's like, like I... watched that movie completely misunderstanding and have gone into working with stocks and everything on Wall Street because of it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I don't know. I do think that. Um, outside of leaving christmas which is pretty is a pretty big downer although i don't know a lot of people might enjoy leaving christmas i don't know um they do really make it look fun you know he's traveling the world he's driving through red square and unloading trucks and like ordering people around 
He's having he's a good like, time with it. He's so happy about it. Like he's calling his wife <laughs> in the answer machine. He's like, he's like, we just did a post in the red square. Like it's crazy. <laughs> right, right. He's, you know, he's a successful dude. He's making a lot of money. He's getting to travel around. He's in charge of a lot. So I don't know. I could see where FedEx would be like, okay, yeah, a lot of people would, a lot of people would like to be the guy that he is in the first 15 minutes, you know? Well, it's funny that it also like, it doesn't end on the note of making you think you know, it, FedEx is bad either. Cause at the end he, he delivers the package that he says to this woman, you know, this package saved my life. And at the end they leave it ambiguous enough that he's now opened to any possibility of the roads before him. And they never say whether or not he'll continue. He could continue working for FedEx. Yeah. Yeah. Although I don't know, it seemed like he was starting to to get away from. It seemed like he wasn't relating with those people as much anymore. And he end. was. Maybe that's just me reading into it a little too much. No, I agree that I don't think he was either. But it is interesting that they leave it ambiguous. But of course, he wouldn't be into it anymore. That he came back. They the first thing they did after he was on a desert island for four years was throw him a party in the hotel and served him fucking crab. Oh yeah, like, yeah. Did you see how the tables like lobsters and oysters and shit? Yep. Like, did you guys yeah. you, like fuck you guys? Get the guy a steak or something, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, get that guy fucking McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, I thought there was a couple of scenes like that that were pretty cool, or a couple of like little details there at the end that were pretty cool. Where, um, they're they're talking to him like he gets some the Dr Pepper, and they're kind of talking to him about getting back into life and just even the fedex cult of it the cult of fedex as i'm calling it in this episode yeah. it all just seems so pointless compared to what he just went through and it's like the little things like when his wife asks him if he wants she when she's like oh i have half milk two percent uh, or whole milk uh, i don't have half and half like you like and it's like do you think he gives do you think he cares at all about what kind of milk you give him right now he hasn't drank milk in four years he does, he's not he's not picky at this point you know yeah like and he's, just he's how come to appreciate the little things right and how nobody really seems to understand that until the lady he sees at the end yes she's kind of like devil may care about all of it and it's it just i could see how that would be so attractive to somebody who is in tom hanks's position at the end yeah, and she I like, also go ahead, go she, ahead. She like gives him a world of opportunity too, because even when he asks, like, I don't really know where I'm going, and she gives him like four different options that like he could choose yeah. from. Yeah, like and showing she him that care. there's like a limitless possibility. Yeah, and she doesn't care which one he picks. She's just like, all right, man, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> and she just takes yeah, off, you know. And I, I, I think it's I, the ending is interesting because when I saw this when I was younger, I hated the ending, hated it. Yeah. I thought it was so stupid. I didn't <laughs> understand what the heck it was about. Um, that's something that I've changed my mind on big time this this time around. Yeah. I um the ending, especially that last part and how it connects back to the beginning and how in a weird way, him and that lady's story, I forget her name. What's her name? Like Bettany or something? This is the the woman that the, kind lady... of book, the book ends the movie. Right, the lady that's on the ranch. Yeah, no, I do not remember her name. All I all I remember about her is just the weird opening scene where she's delivering a package to her husband that's just cheating on her in Russia. Yes, yeah. And <laughs> dude, there's this is actually an interesting thing. From one of the drafts of the script, he opens the package on the island, and what's in the package is a letter from her to her husband. That's yeah. basically saying like, you know, like how horrible the divorce they're going through is and how she wants him back. And it's this really like low place, you know? Yeah. And, and in the, in this draft of the script, he says he never opened it, you know? And that's like such a sad, profound thing. And I think that I kind of wish that was still in the movie because one, I think it's interesting if he opens it just at some point so you learn what was in it I, I don't know i think that would have been cooler especially because yeah. it plays into what's this interesting dichotomy between the two of them where they're both at a really low point in the middle of that movie even though even if they're different you know and they run into each other at the end of it and it's four years later and she's doing kind of okay you know she's she's she seems pretty happy she's got her dog she's got her ranch she tore her husband's name off the sign yeah you know and it's like 
it's it really plays into what he was saying in the speech before it cuts to that crossroads where he's talking about just keep breathing and eventually it'll get better you know yeah eventually you'll find your way out the other end of this and it's all going to be okay it'll work out one way or the other so i don't know i just love that ending and i love him i don't know that he ever really puts it together i think if he reads that letter in the middle in that last scene i'm thinking he's putting it together yeah um so i don't know i kind of wish that he still read it but um it's i think it's still there in the end though yeah it's interesting that you say that that was what um was in a draft because from what i was reading i didn't i didn't read anything about any of the drafts or anything but i was reading from people who have asked robert zemeckis like what was in the fedex package and this was probably like him just blowing smoke up their ass if anything but he had told them that it was a solar powered satellite phone where the hell did you get that idea yeah, I don't think it was a solar powered satellite phone. I think he's just taking the piss. No, ne- yeah, neither do I. I think that too, that he's just taking a piss, but it's always funny because um, that was the thing I, I had seen so many times when I was like looking this up. So it's interesting that there was a draft where this woman was more involved in the middle, which makes a lot of sense because she like bookends both parts of this movie. So clearly right. she's like this almost spiritual presence throughout this movie that's kind of like tethering our central thematic you know, premise throughout it. So it's, it's interesting that they left that on the cutting room floor. Yeah. And I just think it's so, I really wish they didn't again, because they're going through it in very different ways, but they're both going through losing the person they love the most, you know, he's doing it because he's on an Island and neither of them want to lose each other. They still very much love each other, but they can't. And then by the time he gets back, it's way too late. Right. Um, And, and this other lady is going through, you know, a more traditional divorce, probably, Maybe with some international travel thrown in there, but not quite being <laughs> stranded on a desert island. But they're they're still going through the same kind of emotions in those two processes. So I don't know. It just it just really it's a thing that to me would have tied it all together with a very nice bow. But dude, one of the biggest things that I gotta I I need to just say is you know we were talking about you know the Academy Awards before. How did Wilson not get a Best Supporting Actor nom? Wilson! He deserves one. No, I don't think he deserves one. He's just a volleyball with paint on it. <laughs> just a volleyball with paint on it. It's such he a funny character, it. though, to put in there. Like, because they, they were just right. like, we need, we need someone for him to bounce off of. Like, what do we got? They're like, what if he finds a volleyball and like cuts his hand, and when his bloody paw print gets on it, it kind of looks like a face. It's like genius, Jim. Let's do it. Yeah, it's funny and it's unique, right? And it it definitely adds something that's, again, we talked about this earlier with Save the Last Dance, right? It's something that's memorable that till the end of time, people will remember about the movie Castaway. Exactly, yeah. Because you cannot remember or anything about that movie, but if somebody goes like, well said, like you instantly know (laughs) what that's from. Well (laughs) said! I'm sorry, well said. All right, so I think think we covered the movie um do you want to do a little bit of an imdb dive oh yeah absolutely all right so let's let's start with um you know what though let's start with uh zemeckis because i want to save i want to save tom hanks you can do a whole dissertation on tom hanks right he's got a he's got a filmography we're gonna get to um yeah yeah yeah, jim hit me hit me with some hit me with some this or that so, right, this is the part of the show where I try and figure out what score you're going to give the movie at the end. <laughs> ah, so, ah, I'm learning a little yeah. bit about why you brought this one to the table. Yeah. You're trying this to figure out what I'm going to rate this movie. So right. that I'm going to compare it to about nine or ten other movies, and then I'm going to see, kind of get a ballpark for how you feel about it, and that may or may not affect my score at the end. I don't know. We'll have you to see. You sneaky bastard. So... <laughs> We're starting with Zemeckis. Okay. I'm going to start with one that I know you really, really like. Uh, uh, Castaway? Do you? You say it then. Castaway or? Who Framed Roger Rabbit? (laughs) You got it. Absolutely. That's what I was going to ask. As soon as you said, you know, I love it. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That's one of my, that's in my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Yeah. And it is a classic movie. I'm with you on that one. I agree. Castaway or Romancing the Stone? Castaway. Castaway. Okay. Romancing the you... Romancing the Stone is fun, but it's it's just it's schlock. 
at the end of the day. And this this yeah. feels a little bit higher tier than than Romancing the Stone. Like Romancing the Stone is fun, but at the end of the day, it's a knockoff Indiana Jones. That's fair. I haven't seen that movie in a minute. I might need to rewatch it, but I think I would pick Romancing the Stone. Interesting. I mean, I guess we just have to go here if we're going to talk about Robert Zemeckis, but yeah. I mean, uh, just, Castaway just do it. or Back to the Future. The first one? No, Back to the Future 2. Sorry. Hold on. How did did he not make Back to the Future? He made all three of them. Where's the other? Where's back? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's like, what? <laughs> don't mind me. Yeah, that's what I thought. And then I was he scrolling only... through it and I'm like, I don't see it anywhere. Where is it? He only came in uh, for part two. Yeah. So, um, all right, let's cut, let's cut that part out and let me ask you again. Absolutely not. So, Castaway or Back to the Future? Back to the Future. Back to the Future is a fucking classic. Like, that's... Yeah, it's it's hard to pick. That one's, It's hard that to was, pick any Zemeckis I would, movie over Back the, to the Future. The only, ca- the only Back to the Future movie I would put Castaway above would be the third one. Okay, that's fair, yeah. That's fair. I think... Mm, I might, yeah, no, actually, I would, I wouldn't, I don't even know if I would put it about the third one. Interesting. I'm going to say it. That's fair. I don't know if I, I would. I, I wouldn't blame you. The third one's still a fucking fun ride. The Dude, third I one's got realize... ZZ Top. Yeah, right. <laughs> I didn't realize how many movies that I really like that Robert Zemeckis directed. Now, yeah, now that you're deep diving so, in there. What else we got? This is another one. Um, Castaway or Contact? Oh, dude, that's a tough right? one. Contact. Right? That's, Contact. I think that's the toughest one I've had so far. Contact. I uh, fucking yeah. love Carl Sagan, and I think Robert Zemeckis directed the shit out of that movie. I think that movie's fantastic. Yeah, I do like Contact a lot. Yeah, that movie, that movie <laughs> slaps. I watched that pretty recently, too. The, the Matthew McConaughey stuff's a little weird. Um, but everything but with I Jody do Foster like Contact is, a lot. Yeah, and that's um that ending, the ending of Contact when she goes through the weird wormhole thing or whatever. Yeah. That's one of, like, the first time I saw that was one of the most gripping, like, 10, 15 minutes of a movie I've ever seen. I was yes. blown away the first time I saw that. It's fantastic. Jim, let me ask you this. Yeah. What was the movie he made before Castaway and the one he made after Castaway? Well, actually, gotcha. I'm, I'm assuming the one before Castaway is What Lies Beneath. Yeah, that it's. I mean, not not maybe not necessarily the one he made, but the one that came out yeah, just that came out away was what lies beneath, and then the one okay. that came out just after, the Polar Express. I would put Castaway above both of those things. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen either of them, so I can't. I don't know that I have an opinion. What lies beneath? Definitely worth your time because it is absurd. Polar really? Express is just terrible. Okay. Yeah, I've never seen Polar Express. I was never super interested in it. Oh, it's haunting. It's one of the few okay. Tom Hanks movies I would not return to. Oh, we'll see it again with uh, Tom Hanks. Yeah, I got one more for Zemeckis. That okay, be, just because we because we can't talk about Actually, I can't see this movie and not talk about it. Is it Flight? It's Flight. Yeah. <laughs> Castaway or Flight? It's fucking tough, man. Both those movies are really good. Fuck um flight yeah i think i'm on flight dude flight it's enough as so, zemeckis give me give me my yeah, boy it's enough en- enough as zemeckis let's do tom hanks i don't give know boy. i guess i'll do what i just said for him because um you there's gonna be a lot go here that movie, we want to look at yeah you right? can honestly just go <laughs> movie gonna... after just so tom hanks has got so many I feel like you got to speed around it. Like no like big thoughts, literally just this or this, right. this or this, this or this, this or this. And we'll yeah, find that's out fair. where Castaway is is kind of settling in. I think it's either that or you could just talk generally like about where you think it falls like in his uh, thing. But let's do the let's do the lightning round. Yeah, lightning round, lightning round. And Castaway or Splash? Castaway. I'm going to say Splash. Okay. Castaway or Bachelor Party? Castaway. I know you're going to say Bachelor Party. No, I'd say <laughs> Castaway. <laughs> castaway or Big? Big. Yeah, Big is like an easy win. Have you ever seen Punchline? Yeah, where they're like, they're like the stand-up comedians with like Sally Field. Yeah, him and Sally Fields. Yeah, so okay, Castaway or Punchline? 
Cast away. I fucking hate punchline. Cast away. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have even said punchline, honestly. You can cut that one out. All right. This is what I watched pretty recently. Cast away or the burbs? Cast away. The long Cast the away. The, I did not love the burbs. You did not love the burbs? No. Okay. Cast away or Joe versus the volcano? Cast away. Joe versus the volcano. What are you no, nuts? Oh, I wish this wasn't a lightning round. Castaway or a league of their own? A league of their own. Yeah, a league of their own. Castaway or Sleepless in Seattle? Sleepless in Seattle. I don't know if I've ever seen that one, but I felt like I had to say it because I know the name. Okay, Castaway or Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Yeah, Philadelphia. Castaway yeah. or Forrest Gump? Come on. Come on. Forrest Gump. Yeah, Forrest Gump. Castaway or Apollo 13? It's too easy, but you got to say it. Apollo 13. Apollo 13. <laughs> all right. Can we just do all the Toy Stories in one Castaway or any Toy Story movie? Any Toy Story movie. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen four, but I would say, yeah. Castaway or Saving Private Ryan? Let's just get it out of the yeah, way. Let's get, come on, Saving Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan. Castaway or You've Got Mail? Ooh. That's, that's actually a tough one. I do love You've Got Mail. But it's so late 90s, it hurts at times. Castaway. Yeah. I haven't seen You Got Mail in a while, but I'm going to pick Castaway. Castaway or the Green Mile? Green Mile. Uh, Green Mile. Okay, so I'm going to pause the lightning round here for just a beat to say we've just reached the year 2000. So the, yeah, so now we've just reached the year where he made Castaway. Right. Castaway is the next movie on his filmography. So, I, Which, I mean, we did like 15 of them already. <laughs> that's great. That's, yeah, it's that, that dude. That dude's 90s filmography. Just stellar. All right. There's a couple more I have to do. You do. Because you haven't even gotten to my you, favorite Tom Hanks movie yet. I think I know what it is. Castaway or Road to Perdition? Road to Perdition. Road to Perdition. Castaway or Catch Me If You Can? That's my favorite Tom Hanks movie. Catch me if you can. Castaway. Fuck out of here. <laughs> Castaway. Uh, does see? Do people think this one's a heavy hitter? Castaway or the Terminal? That's not a heavy hitter, right? It's not a terrible movie, but yeah, I don't know if I put it as a heavy hitter. Castaway. Castaway. And Wait, were you serious just... about Catch Me If You Can? Yeah, dude, I watched Catch Me If You Can more recently. To I did not like it, dude. Oh, I did not we're... like it. Gonna have to stop talking to you now. <laughs> yeah, it was it was not as good once I realized that like it's a weird movie where it just feels like it's all just over and over again, like him being like, Now I'm gonna pretend to be a doctor, and then he goes and pretends to be a doctor for like five minutes, and then he's like, Now I'm gonna pretend to be a lawyer, and then he goes and pretends to be a lawyer for five minutes. Yeah, and it's, it's like great, it doesn't Jim. really <laughs> I mean, yeah, Leo is good in it, but I don't really like it. <laughs> Castaway or Asteroid City? Have you seen that one? Oh, uh, yeah. I actually just watched that the other night because I was trying to catch up on two 2023 movies that I missed. So I actually yeah, just watched this movie last week. Um, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. I'm not. I don't like Wes Anderson movies that much. He's not fair enough. Kind of kind of my kind of tea. So Castaway. I'm gonna take Tom Asteroid Hanks. Tom City. Hanks is also in like five seconds of this movie. Yeah, I mean, that's fair, but he's in it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Very true. All right. I think I got all the big ones that I've seen. Um, you're not okay, even going no, to touch there's on the Da Vinci Code? There's definitely more. All right. Castaway or the Da Vinci Code? Castaway. Castaway. Castaway or Cloud Atlas? Oh, dude. How did you miss Cloud Atlas? I know. Cloud. There's so many Tom Hanks movies. Cloud Atlas. Yeah, I agree. Castaway or Captain Phillips? Captain Phillips. Uh, I don't know that I've seen that one. Oh, it's a good one. So I guess I have to pick Castaway. Saving Mr. Banks or Castaway? <laughs> Castaway. Okay. You know what? I think the lightning round rule should be that I don't say Castaway. I just say Bridge of Spies. Bridge of Spies. That's a really good movie. Yeah, I take Bridge of Spies. Sully. Castaway. Castaway, The Post. I haven't seen this one, but I feel like I have to say it because it's been nominated for a lot of Oscars. Castaway. I haven't seen it. I can't pick. Um, and I think we just about covered it. Yeah, that sounds I about know. like the game. But that's just a testament to show how fucking stellar this man's career has been. That you would, we've named so many movies 
of his, and I would give so many of those movies just high marks. He's yeah. fantastic. Is that is that whole section going to make it in there? There's no way. We did like 40 movies. Well, I guess the real question here, Jim, is did this give you any insight into what you think I'm going to rate this movie? I I, I don't know. I thought it was going <laughs> to kind of at the beginning, but then we did a lot, and it was a whole lightning round thing. So I don't think I was paying as much attention as I would have hoped. There's also it like wasn't as, so it wasn't as useful as in past weeks. Let me put it that way. Well, when Tom Hanks has so many movies, you kind of just get lost in where Castaway was in comparison to the rest of them without writing down like where all these are. As we've been right, saying I got, them. I got so wrapped up in the fun of the lightning round. <laughs> That's the beauty of the lightning round. Yeah. Lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt. All right, Jim, let's hear it. It's time it's that time to finally put to the test to see will the list survive another week what is your final rating for castaway so i definitely like this movie a lot better than when i watched it when i was younger i obviously if you listen to this whole episode and you've made it this far i realize that i have some qualms with it i have some bones to pick uh i'm gonna give it a three out of five three out of five yeah, three out of five, because I think a lot of my criticisms are are a tidbit nitpicky, and they're um they're bordering on the realm of me trying to rewrite the movie for people like Robert Zemeckis and Tom Hanks. So I just I I do understand that it was well made, and I give it a three out of five. And I think this is good that you gave it three out of five because I think it's I think it's going to give itself into a spot that I think you'll be all right with, because I'm going to give this movie. Four stars. Okay. And okay. I have and I have all the same, you know, things that you said that there are definitely, you know, nitpicks that we've given about this movie. But at the end of the day, when I watched this movie the other night with Heather, I was bought in. Like I was like I, I had my things in the back of my head, obviously, that I thought about after we watched it and everything. But for the majority of this movie, I was bought in. I was sold. I was carried along on Tom Hanks's journey, just like they wanted us to in this movie. When he lost Wilson, I felt like I lost Wilson. When he lost yeah. his ex-girlfriend, I felt like I lost his ex-girlfriend. It was sure. it definitely hit on the premise of the movie that you wanted to when you bought the wait, ticket. Wait, wait. Hold on. When he lost who? <laughs> oh okay gotcha god sorry about that <laughs> so this movie definitely definitely lived up to what i was expecting out of this movie from the purchase of the ticket and that's what i try to look at from these movies even after we've given all of our nitpicks and everything so i'm going to give this movie a four star a funny little side note um before we put these two together is when yeah. i watched it i i watched it with heather because this was a movie, this is one of the few Tom Hanks movies she hasn't seen, so I, she needed to to enjoy the spectacle of this movie, and she was so bought into this movie. I always know if she's into a movie or not by how many times she's looked at her phone, and she didn't look at her phone once through this movie, but she huh, yeah. absolutely hated that him and Helen Hunt didn't get back together again. She wanted it so badly to the point yeah. that she was fully on board with this woman just leaving her husband and child. Right. And dude. Again. And literally the movie ended. She wouldn't give me her rating for it. She's like, I need to sleep on it. Like she slept yeah. on it. Next but morning I know it's good, dude. Next morning I ask and she goes, I hated it. Five stars. <laughs> yeah exactly it's like if you watch a movie and somebody says what did you think and you go i need to sleep on it that was a good movie yeah so <laughs> you can't like for you to need to process it for that long it definitely hit you in a certain way you know sure, so yeah that's shows... a great i'm glad you told that story that's great yeah so it shows that this this movie definitely lived up to what it was promising right. you yeah, I can definitely I, I w wouldn't give it either of those scores four or five, but I would never, never give anybody too hard of a time for giving it either of those scores. Perfectly fair. So with my four stars and your three stars, that gives us a combined rating of seven out of ten, which I think yeah. is respectable. That's a, that's a solid spot for for Castaway. I think it's going to age well. I think that's a movie that's going to stay right around where it should for a long time. Yeah, so do I. And seven is good enough now to tie it in the fifth spot 
with How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which also sits at a seven. So it puts this movie just okay. ahead of Armageddon with 6.5 and just behind okay. The Lost World now with 7.5. So I guess the next question is that we're going to have to come to terms with or figure out as we go into more and more of these is just what we're going to do when we come across a time when we have like seven movies all have seven. How do we tier those? Because they can't both be five. So if we've had How the Grinch Stole Christmas is sitting in the seven and Castaway is sitting at a seven, which one gets the higher spot? Yeah, I mean, if I were to find myself in that position. So that, Jim, Grinch or Castaway? Yeah, so I don't know that we should talk about it now. I think what we should do is if we get to a point where four or five movies are tied, and we might have to decide on whether it's four or five and just stick with that number. But when we get to that point, we should do an episode where we like battle royale those movies. We do like a 16 bracket tournament. Yeah, we rewatch all four or five of them. Oh, fuck and, off. <laughs> now, as I, now as I'm saying this, maybe it should be three. <laughs> maybe five's a little high. Um, but we rewatch all of them and we 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 break them down and compare them by categories and see like which one comes out on top. And like, we do like a tiebreaker basically. Yeah. yeah. So we get, we really dive into the, the thicket of it. Right. And then there'll be like a 7.0 a, a 7.0 B it's, it's a little tricky because you don't want to rewatch too many in a week. <laughs> right. But at the same time, you're going to run into that problem a lot where, you know, the longer we do this, there's going to be a lot more movies than three tied at seven. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, absolutely. So yeah, this honestly might just turn into a podcast where we battle Royale every week and the rankings are just constantly, constantly going up and down just in the ones that we rated seven. You know, it just, it just becomes a rankings podcast at that point. Right. Right. Where <laughs> at some point it's just, it's just become too big. It's self-sustaining now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yes, but that will be hopefully way far in the future. Uh, that is not the case so far tonight. Only two movies sitting at seven right now. So I think we can comfortably sleep on that for now. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sleep on it. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, we'll we'll sleep, put a much, in that. Much like my wife, we're going to sleep on it. And then we'll come to terms with it. <laughs> oh, God. Well, why? That's oh, not suggestive. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. Maybe cut that part out. <laughs> I was like, what is he trying to say? And then I realized that you just told the story about her sleeping on the movie Castaway way too late in the game. Before I should have realized that before I said anything. It would have been the right time. <laughs> Fucking crying right now. <laughs> oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jim. Oh, boy. All right, Jim. Any ideas on to next week's episode? Would you like a hint as always? Yeah, give me a hint. Okay. Uh, so we are now officially 2000 is done. We are now actually moving into the year 2001. It is a 2001 movie. That's my hint. It came out. In I'm going to give you more relax <laughs> or settle your horses over there. Wilson. It's a 2001 movie. It was, ah, fuck, this is going to give it away, but I'll, I'll give it. This will be my only other hint. It was the, the, Kicking off point for a wrestler turned actor. Oh, for a wrestler turned actor in 2001. Oh, it's got to be this, right? Okay, Wait, I think I got it. Tell you. It's got to be the, the mummy, the sequel, the Scorpion King. It's, well, it's not the Scorpion King. That's not the sequel. Well, what's the mummy 2? The Mummy Returns. What's the, what's the subtitle? Oh, it's The Mummy Returns. Okay. The Mummy Returns. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. The Just Mummy copying Returns, the Batman yeah. formula. The Mummy, yeah, The Mummy oh, Returns. Okay. Batman, Batman uh, Returns. Debut is a pretty generous word for what The Rock <laughs> did in that movie. <laughs> the CGI monstrosity that The yeah. Rock was for that movie. Um, this is going to be an interesting one to go back to also because I whenever i want to watch a mummy movie i'm always watching the first one so i can't tell you the last time i watched the mummy returns so this is going to be a fun one to go back to what about you 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I love the first two Mummy movies as far as I remember. And I've seen the first one like pretty recently. So I haven't seen The Mummy Returns in a while, but I'm sure it's going to hold up. Yes, we will see come next week. But that will do it for all of us here this week. Jim, do you have anything to send the people home with tonight? This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. All right, damn, man. Jeez. <laughs> oh, oh, fuck. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just having a little fun with my soundboard. I'm having a lot of fun with the soundboard tonight. But yes, that's it for Jim. He's done with this conversation. You all can fuck off and go home. That will do it for all of us here at Front Row Cinema. Until next time, we'll see you at the movies.